The Queen's Gambit is a show that is truly something special. It's an almost perfect miniseries across the board. Everything from its performances, to its costumes, to its direction, to its score, to its sets, to its writing, well, I could go on. It's incredible, and if you haven't watched it yet, now is your time to do so. Because to get into this video, I'm going to have to cover spoilers from the series. So pause and go. I can wait. So, The Queen's Gambit is incredible in almost every way a person could judge a series. But there's one thing that it does that really struck me, and that is how it deals with addiction. Our main character, Elizabeth Harmon, isn't just a chess prodigy. She's an orphan, a victim of a world where neither of her parents wanted her. A world where her own mother tried to murder her while committing suicide. Following that, she is taken to an orphanage, where she is subjected to the harsh reality that whether or not she is adopted is well out of her control. To confront this total lack of control over her life, she uses tranquilizer pills to escape. Using the pills, she creates her own world, an imaginary chessboard, where she is in control of all of the pieces. And so the addiction begins, and launches an early warning flare when she is caught breaking into the medical room at the orphanage to get more of the drugs that she so desperately craves. Now, many stories, even highly rated ones, often reduce addiction to the substance being used. The person was fine and dandy until that evil drug, whatever it is, enters their life. And now it's this malicious thing that has corrupted them. But most psychiatrists would profoundly disagree with that portrayal. And one does. In an article responding to that common trope, psychiatrist Lance Dodes writes in Psychology Today, Addictive actions are the result of a complex function of the mind. They occur when people feel overwhelmingly helpless. Taking an action reverses that feeling of helplessness, and is powerfully driven by the rage that always occurs in response to feeling overwhelmingly helpless. And because the action is driven by this normal rage, it is emotionally compelled. The rage becomes a powerful urge to repeat the behavior. In other words, though drugs can be physically addictive, the deeper psychological reasoning behind an addiction is very often caused by a person feeling like their life has fallen beyond their control. In the face of their world, they feel helpless, and their patterns of addictive behavior offer them a feeling of control. So, when a character is orphaned, at the mercy of a harsh Christian school, and all she has to enjoy in life is chess during very limited sessions, which are also totally out of her control, well, that's a perfect setup to send her down the path of addiction. Beth even reveals her struggle with that feeling of helplessness when she's asked by a journalist why it is that she enjoys chess so much. It's an entire world of just 64 squares. I feel safe in it. I can control it. And that's all the more so, because when she is finally adopted, her new father almost immediately disappears, upending both her and her new mother's life. And that new mother is an addict herself, escaping her own feelings of helplessness at the bottom of a bottle, and using those same tranquilizer pills. So though the show makes it clear that both characters grow to deeply love one another, it also makes it very clear that they enable each other's addictions. As Beth grows into the world of chess, she begins to lean on both the pills and the alcohol to grant her that sense of fighting back against helplessness. She uses the pills to combat the pressure of playing other players like Beltic, and she abuses alcohol when social situations leave her feeling vulnerable or alone. After her adoptive mother passes away and she loses her game in Paris, she tries to leave the substances behind. Instead, she throws herself into compulsively remodeling and cleaning the home she now owns. 
that is not uncommon in anyone who exhibits addictive behavior. Or as Lance Dodes notes in a quote that's unrelated to the Queen's Gambit, but is actually totally suited for it, nobody would say that a person who compulsively cleans his house is doing it to dull his pain. Yet the psychology is the same as if he compulsively drank alcohol. Indeed, as I've pointed out before, people often switch from drug to non-drug compulsive addictive behaviors. The fact that they can substitute for each other shows that they operate the same way. The Queen's Gambit totally nails this. Like I said, that quote is from well before the show had even aired. And that's why, as soon as Beth is done with her home project, she goes out for a celebratory dinner, and while at first rejecting a drink, she very rapidly falls back into her old alcoholic patterns. Her friends are concerned and are trying to contact her, but she ignores them. She dodges her prior commitments. She'd rather be at home with her addictions. The only way she can feel in control. So it takes an impromptu visit from a very special childhood friend to set her back on the right path. That's because the true recovery from addiction comes when a person uncovers the drive behind their feeling of helplessness. When they delve into what causes their emotional state, they can then begin to recover. As Dodes puts it, if the man in this novel thought of his pills as the problem, he would waste time in treatment talking about them how they work physically, and why they're bad for him, instead of talking and learning about what inside his mind led to his compulsive use of them. By describing the pills and the images as separate, a writer misses the nature of addiction. So it's in confronting her past when Jolene arrives that Beth truly begins to resolve her own feelings. It's in that final episode that we see her reflecting on the final rejection from her birth father, as well as the attempted murder-suicide committed by her birth mother. She also returns to the orphanage, where she focuses on her childhood there. On her traumas, yes, but also on her supportive relationship with the chess-playing janitor, Mr. Scheibel, who had just passed away. In facing these ghosts of her past, she begins the journey to banishing them. This is further helped by the friends that come together to support her. Jolene makes it clear that they are sisters, and that they'll be there for each other no matter what. I'm not your guardian angel. I'm not here to save you. No, I can barely save me. I'm here because you need me to be here. That's what family does. And when Beth is starting to feel all alone again in Moscow, to the point where she admits that she wants to have a drink, her chess buddies all rally, and she faces her last ghost. A living one who she loved, and who now joins her as a best friend. This unconditional support from those she cares about helps ground her in a moment where she had again begun to feel helpless. And it's those two things combined that see her through it. She stops drinking, she throws away the pills, and she confronts her own doubts about whether she can even play chess without using those substances. She takes full control. The helplessness is gone. Without the weight of her addictions, she waltzes through all of Russia's champion chess players, and when she meets the Grandmaster himself, she is able to visualize a chessboard just like she always could, without the pills. Only here, instead of shadowy and flickering, the visualization is clear and sharp, and it's that clarity of mind that drives her on to her final victory. Celebrations ensue, but that's not what really matters. Because this story was never really about chess. It was about a hurt woman who felt alone and helpless, finding something that she loved. And in that love, she found others and faced up to her trauma, and in doing so, she regained control of her life. 
That's why the final scene of the show isn't a medal-pinning ceremony or an exuberant party. It's Beth taking control. She steps out of the car, leaving behind her literal jailers, and sets herself free. And she goes out into the street to play chess. Just for fun. Because she loves it. The story of Queen's Gambit could be about any of us. About how helplessness can send anyone, even the brightest prodigies, into addiction. And how it's in coming to terms with the emotions behind that addiction that truly begins the path to recovery. Addiction is a way for people to impose order on that essential feeling of helplessness and chaos that we can all bump into over the course of our lives. Whether due to a global pandemic, the loss of a loved one, or even just waking up and taking in the absolute dystopia of a world we've created for ourselves, there's more than enough reasons out there for us to feel like we are lost at sea. And so addictions, whether drugs or intense fixations on behaviors like compulsively cleaning or going to the gym, are a way for people to feel like they're in control. And if we lose one addiction, we are more likely than not to replace it with another. The Queen's Gambit understood this, portraying Beth's revolving door of addictions, from pills to alcohol to fixing the house and then back again. In doing so, she loses touch with the game she loves and the people who love her. But the series also shows us the way out. It shows us that in confronting the cause of our helplessness, in facing the deeper emotional reasoning behind our addictions, we can come out on the other side. And once we do, not only are we free of our addictions, we're more able to enjoy the things we love and more open to those who love us. We are in control and we are free. I think another thing that the series gets really right that I can get into in a much shorter fashion is the impact that someone like Mr. Scheibel can have on a person. He gets her started on her journey and he believes in her and sends her to that high school club where she beats everyone. And even when she's left, he supports her by sending her $10 so she can enter her first tournament. And I think something that all of us underestimate is the impact that all of us as one person can make on someone else. All it takes is just one person. Whether you're in the arts or into chess or you're really talented at Excel. If you have someone out there who believes in you or who supports your work, that can mean the whole world. It can change your life, taking something you're talented at and love, but are maybe insecure about, and giving you that confidence that it's something you should pursue. So consider this homework. I know there is someone in your life who you really believe in. We all have them around us. And your homework is to go out there and tell them that you do. Show them that you do. Don't do it for yourself, don't expect any validation, just do it as a selfless act. Because I can guarantee you that whether or not they even have the emotional bandwidth to reply to you, it can mean the whole world when someone, just one someone, reaches out and believes in the work that you do. The world is in dire need of more Mr. Scheibels, and it's remarkably easy to be one thankfully. So go out there and follow his example. All it ever cost him was some empathy and ten dollars. Anybody can be Mr. Scheibel. So what are you waiting for? Go out there and show someone that you appreciate their work. Whether it's videos on YouTube, stories they write, or whatever else. Be there Mr. Scheibel.